first time I saw it, um, they used to walk here across the park because the reservoir wasn't there. And it was rather misty. And what one saw were the reindeer horns, the tips of the horns coming up out of the valley through the mist. And you heard the tinkle of the triangle, the boy beating time with the triangle. And it was um, quite an eerie sort of feeling about it. It's an early September morning in the village of Abbots Bromley. But while the rest of the country dances to the 20th century tune of commuting to work, this Staffordshire village is about to step out of time to recreate one of the oldest dance rituals in Europe. The horns are at least a thousand years old. We know that now because some years ago one of the horns was broken and uh, in being repaired we took the opportunity to have it carbon dated. The date came out at around 1080, which puts them at the time of uh, William the Conqueror and the Conquest, and they're obviously older than that. It's an unhurried start to a full day of dancing, from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. The centuries start to roll back with the arrival of the dancers, Maid Marian and the Hobby Horse, two small boys, one with a bow and arrow and the other with a triangle, and the musician and jester, all folklore characters who've been included over the centuries. They gather at the 13th century church of St. Nicholas, who by legend travelled by reindeer sleigh. The church named after him is appropriately enough now the home of the ancient horns. And despite its pagan origins, the dance now starts with a Christian blessing. The reindeer horns are believed to have been brought over by the Vikings, but why the dance started or how remains a mystery. The speculation over the origins of the dance has fascinated historians, locals, and even the horn dancers themselves for years. The theories range from a celebration of peasant concessions to pick up wounded deer in Needwood Forest, to celebration of the birth and death of nature, or a fertility rite based on the rutting of deers. But perhaps part of the charm of the horn dance is in the endless possibilities. When the bow and arrow comes and shoots the hobby horse, the horse dies momentarily and then he rises again and that drives the evil spirits away. That's what it's all about. It's a different story every year for him. <laughs> he amazes me how he thinks of what. <laughs> but for those who come in close contact with the pig's bladder, there's only one legend. Oh, that could be twins by next year, that could. If you get hit by the bladder, um, you're supposed to sort of within a few months, that's the tale, become pregnant. Um, I have had stories where people have been struggling and they come back the following year and there's a little lad or a little girl in the pram light. So whether it's true or not, I don't know, but that is the tale about the bladder. With so many superstitions surrounding the horn dance, it's a wise local who decides to follow tradition unquestioningly. When we took over from the previous farmer, he said, there's just one thing I should tell you. The horn dancers come every year. I've heard of the horn dancers um, in the village, you know, in the evenings. That's the only recollection I had of them when I was younger. Uh, but I didn't realise that they came round some farms and spent all day dancing around. And he said, well, you've got to do it. We've been here a hundred years and we've always entertained them. So it's tradition and uh, you're expected to provide them with a drink and, and socialise with them a little. And uh, I thought, oh, Oh, well, all right, then it'll probably take half an hour or an hour, and I suppose I'll have to put up with it. So they came the first year we were here, and uh, that's 20, I think it's about 22nd or 3rd horn dance now. And uh, they, they sort of stayed on a little while, and we had another drink, and stayed on a little longer, and had another dance, and oh, I thought I'd better give them another drink, and 
that's how it seemed to grow, but there weren't many followers then. Uh, perhaps 10 or 15 or something. Now there seem to be a lot more, and they say a little bit longer still. <laughs> so uh, it's become a bit of a bigger commitment than I first thought. But for newcomers to the village buying a property on the Horn Dancers' route, such long-standing social obligations can be somewhat daunting. It was uh, quite a surprise to discover that uh, it was a time-honoured tradition for the dancers to come and, uh, and dance in our house. And we're very pleased to discover that this is the case. But this is the first time we've done it, so there's a little bit of uh, nervousness as to what's involved, and uh, it's all worked out very happily wonderful to have uh, a good crowd of um, visitors to come in and enjoy it as well. As far as the horn dancers are concerned, without the public, their dance has no meaning. Wherever we go, the general public go. If they aren't allowed, we don't go. The only person who has the rights to stop the general public is Lady Baggett, and that is the only one. So if somebody tries to stop the public, then we don't turn up. Until recent times, the horn dance was watched only by local people. It started as an integral part of the Barthelemy Fair, and then became part of Wakes Week. Although there are some attractions now, for some of the older residents of Abbots Bromley, it'll never be the same as in the good old days. Well, my father was in a church for quite a long time. Uh, they used to, well, of course, they didn't used to have all this. It used to be the wakes, used to be called the wakes. And we used to have uh, roundabouts and all that sort of thing. We had one lot down in the field opposite the Bag of Arms. We had some more in the, in the marketplace and uh, the coach and horses. And, and at one time there was a, there used to be a ladies club and uh, they saw a parade that day. And there are others who'd like to see a revival of a longer festival. I think I'd like to go back to the old hotel and fair. I'd say Saturday, Sunday the Monday, because I think the fair was originally a five-day thing. Uh, culminated the horn dance on the Monday, which would seem natural. Make it a lot worth, more worthwhile for the traders and all the work we put in, not we, let's say, say the children, for one day, and yet a bad day like this, it's quite a disappointment. Having remained relatively unknown outside the village for generations, the horn dance is now being seen by those trying to encourage tourists to the county as an ideal opportunity to put Staffordshire on the map. One of the problems of Staffordshire is its image. Many people have the perception that it's an industrialised county well, it couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, we've got the pottery industry, but we've got a vast uh, range of uh, landscapes. We've got the Peak District Park in the north. We've got rolling landscapes uh, in central Staffordshire and many picturesque villages such as Average Bromley. So when they get a feel of the county and enjoy the, the horn dance, then hopefully they'll explore some other part of the county, such as Shugborough Hall or Litchfield Cathedral or go into the pottery industry or take a stroll in the Peak District. And while it still is intrinsically a low-key event, there is now a move to provide more interest for visitors. Some of them even bring their own wares to sell while they enjoy the festivities. To somebody who sees a great deal of dancing, there's perhaps not a great deal to it. It's, it's very simple dance and the music's very simple, but the men obviously really get a lot of pleasure out of doing it. And the little jokes and wisecracks and the little ways they try to trick each other and things, it's all very entertaining. Having such a picturesque setting no doubt helps to preserve the sense of history that surrounds the horn dance. Abbots Bromley was at one time an important market town with its own green and butter cross dating back to the time of Edward III. On Horn Dance Day in particular, the desire to acknowledge that heritage is keenly felt. Having taken over the goat, I thought I'd sort of go into some of the history of it. And um, it's the late 16th century building itself, um, but it's, it's got attachments to the church and, and the, the, the village in general, in terms of um, it doubled up as the town hall, magistrate's court. In fact, down the cellar, I've still got part of a priest tunnel between here and the church, which is not as obviously now connected. Uh, I actually use it as a wine cellar. Um, 
the, the whole village and this building in particular is really steeped in history. The tradition's always been that we give them the tea and they'll be here probably at half five and have their tea, they do another dance out in front, which is their third, uh, their second time round, and then they return here uh, round about eight o'clock before the horns go back to the church. And as I say, it is tradition and we are delighted to be part and parcel of it and as long as it's going we will be part and parcel and delighted to welcome them here. But when it comes to historical claims, there's no one who can challenge the Baggett family's connections with the horn dance itself. As far as I know, they've been involved with it ever since Bliffield's been here. And uh, we know that there must have been some sort of habitation here at the time of the Doomsday because there was a priest at Bliffield, that's mentioned in the Doomsday Survey. And of course the horn dance dates from Saxon times. Um, so I'm not quite sure how long they've been involved with it, but I use the phrase that's used locally, time out of mind. <laughs> and historical records may be sketchy, but there are few who dare to deny the Fowles and Bentley's claims of having led the dance down through the generations. It's got to go back with the Fowles and the Bentleys for hundreds of years don't know exactly how long, but my father used to tell me it was 800 years it had been in our family when I was only a lad. So you can add another 59 on top of that. So I should imagine it must be creeping up to a thousand years since the Fowl family and the Bentleys was involved, you know, been involved. I keep saying I'm going to retire. I said I'll retire this year because it's my 60th year, and this next year because it's my 60th year. And they say, no, you won't, you'll keep it. So I'll be back, I suppose. Habit or deep-rooted ritual, whichever it is, the ancient legends have found favour with an increasing number of pagan followers who make their own particular brand of pilgrimage to Abbots Bromley. It's a very old ritual, the horn dance, and it does attract a lot of pagan people, witches, white witches, whatever they want to call themselves. And, um, Personally, I'm quite interested in seeing them, you know, they're quite entertaining and, uh, you know, it's something for everybody to look at as well as the horn dancers. Um, they come along, they, you know, they sometimes sleep in fields, light fires, sleep in tents or, or whatever, but, uh, you know, they've never, ever been any trouble to us, so, you know, certainly wouldn't discourage them from coming again. We believe it does have a pagan meaning, although we think that meaning's probably been lost in mists of time over the last thousand years or so. It seems to have become partially Christianised at least. But it doesn't feel like it would be a typical Christian festival for us. It seems to be something that's been going on longer and has more of a pagan feel to it. But to long-time faithful followers, such determination to track down pagan origins to this old dance is a waste of time. All I'm saying is we don't know, and I think we should stop trying to go back where we can't find things. We know, for instance, Abbots Bromley is documented in, in the 17th century uh, and, and later. We know that the horns have been carbon dated to the 11th century, but that doesn't mean that they were being used as part of a ceremony at that time. We just know that they are old. They may, they may have been used, we don't know. Uh, we know, for instance, that the horn dancers came out at Christmas at one time to, to collect arms for the, the local poor, and then that later changed to the, the wake's day as it is now. But I say to run around looking for origin theory where there isn't any evidence, I mean, is rather wasteful. Nowadays, of course, we've got the New Age people coming in. They're getting off on something else. Um, fine, if they want to. But uh, to find them kissing the earth at dawn is, um, you know, I, I'd sooner not do that. Get a few more hours in. It's early enough as it is. For the locals, the horn dance has a more temporal feel about it. Well, the drinking side of it, I mean, it takes a lot of practice. Um, basically, we usually start on a Saturday, then Sunday, and then all day Monday. Um, we're not very well by about 11 o'clock. By, by 12, we feel a little bit better. Um, and usually after that, we usually pack up for at least three or four days. But I must admit, there's a lot consumed. 
far more amount than what most people would even imagine. <laughs> I've done my bit for it over the years. <laughs> I should say Holland Dance Day would compare pretty favourably with New Year's Eve. There's always a lot of bad heads round on a Tuesday morning afterwards. Um, as far as the Holland Dance Day itself is concerned, I think it's a great tradition. It should be kept going forever and ever, because otherwise there's a lot of people that come to Albert's Bromley would never even have known about the village, apart from the Holland Dance. It's a great tradition. It's good for the publicans, good for the public. Everybody seems to have a good day. There's not touch with not much trouble at all. And it's the one thing that I think it's put Albert's Bromley on the map. It's the social side of it. I mean, it, I mean, if the, 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 uh, they didn't come from Bromley, you know, I mean, it would be one day uh, where we couldn't have a party. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy just watching them, but and, and the social side, of course. But uh, as I say, you know, it, it's one day that we all look forward to. The drinking comes natural. The dancing's all right on the day. It's the next day that it, you find it was the hardest. <laughs> when you're aching and, you know, you're lying in the bath. And it's over a pint that there's a chance to retell a couple of old stories, like the one when the horn dancers were invited to perform at the Royal Albert Hall. When we got down there, it was a big rush straight off the bus, straight into the press, then a big rush inside to get on, you know, on, do the performance. And things went completely wrong, you know, I mean, we were all scared to death. I mean, let's face it, I mean, we just... Yokels, you know, country, well, not yokels, we're country people, you know. And um, at the night, uh, when we got back to the hotel at night time to have a meal, then we got to the uh, critics' uh, reviews in the papers, which the management had kept for us, got for us, and uh, we got a spate in. So, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't know more. We was talking to some people and uh, then they started putting some major roads round because the scenery was wrong. There was no scenery there whatsoever. All we could see was flashing in the Albert Hall. If you're in the Albert Hall, you're in the arena, and the rest of it's all blacked out. And all you see is cameras flashing. That's all you see, nothing else. So then, on the second performance, they put uh, some major roads in that mark, you know, and uh, we danced around then and we jazzed it all up and we had a good time. You know, I don't mean jazzed it up. We did it like we do it in the village. The original horns now belong to the parish council and replicas are used for events outside the village. But protecting priceless relics is a heavy responsibility. Because they're getting in such a low state now, it's recommended that the, the only time that the real ones are brought now is Horn Dance Day and Fate, fate Day. They have been allowed up to now, but they're getting to a stage now where we think that uh, just Horn Dance Day because, I mean, they're out and they're loose uh, and, you know, obviously they put them down. But if anything happens to them, that's that. But for a village so steeped in tradition, any tampering with established customs is bound to cause controversy. I've been here for six and a half years now, so this is my sixth horn dance. Um, and over the last few years, it has been a little more commercialised. We've had stores on the village green, uh, hamburger vans and such. And uh, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think the village people themselves prefer it to be just as it was, just a, an uncommercialised day. I think if it got too commercialised, it would spoil it. It would just spoil the, the actual horn dance. I don't think it would be a good thing, and I think the village people themselves don't want it to get that way. So far, the emphasis has been on keeping any commercialism in check, with charities and local fundraising efforts, like a mile of pennies for the church roof, being given priority. But the horn dancers, too, have to look on losing a day's work with more of a business-like approach than in ages past when they used to collect for the poor. They're still the original horns, um, going back who knows when. Um, 
We do occasionally have to sort of do a little restoration on them, um, which costs nowadays a lot of money, which is one reason why we do the collection on all those day. Uh, but the clothes are getting, as, as a lot of people can recognise, are getting really worn, is which is where another part of the money goes to. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think it's our booze money, but that is far beyond what it is. Uh, we do want to keep the tradition going as long as we possibly can, and the money we collect on all that day goes towards that tradition, not our being fund as people seem to think. And certainly as the day wears on, it's not only the costumes and horns that are becoming frayed round the edges. We're due for tea now, uh, so that's the hardest part, coming back from a half hour rest and starting again. One, the muscles are stiffened up, and two, it's uphill. Get a bit edgy in the morning, like, and just before you come, like, you, is everything going to be all right? But it usually turns out OK. Waiting to get out of the clothes, because it's here to me. That's the best thing, changing to fresh clothes. I mean, it's a bit wet and sticky and sweaty. Fresh clothes, and nice uh, feeling, isn't it? Nothing to wash. And when you've been involved for 60 years, it's easy to see how today's dancers are making life difficult for themselves. Dance is a little bit quicker now than what it used to be. Because my father would never, he used to take little short steps. Now they, they danced bigger steps, longer steps. And I think that's why they get a lot of knee problems. And I think if they took shorter steps, it'd be a lot better for them. But that's why I have to play a little bit quicker, because they get, they're going to be quicker. So, uh, my father wouldn't, wouldn't want that. Now I'm telling him to slow down. <laughs> The whole day centres around music, and not just the dance of the horns. a shame to miss anything, but every year there are those who miss the whole thing. It's very difficult for visitors to know when the horn dance it actually is. Uh, people in the village know quite well the formula. It's always on the Monday following the first Sunday after the 4th of September. Visitors don't know this, of course, and we find little groups of people wandering about in the village saying, when does the dance start? and they are not very pleased to be told that they're a week early or a week late. But it's as villagers return home from work that outsiders start to take second place. As the dancers face their last hour or so, the locals start to settle down to some serious celebrations in the time-honoured fashion. But such an anachronism as a dance with reindeer horns will only keep going as long as the village and the dancers combined forces to take it forward into future generations. It's the younger ones, you see, that take it on. If it's handed down, you see, the fowls handed it down a lot, and the fowls and Bentleys. Having said that, you see, if, if they keep changing and just put odd ones in to fill up, they, they must keep the, the families going, mustn't they, to make it more, uh, more efficient, I would think. I've already been trained up what I'm like standing now. So I'll just do it when someone's missing or if someone can't do it or some reason or another. But I'm collecting today with me being just a standing in everyone's ear, so. You don't really train for it, do you? You don't. Um, you just like set off and it 
and then you have to just have to follow them and stuff. It doesn't matter. You don't train for it, right? It's my first year. I was really nervous, and I do want to be, do it again. Uh, and your feet are aching, and you get back out and have a nice warm bath. Sometimes you get fed up of playing the triangle all the time and you get sore arms, but it doesn't bother you. I like to carry the horns around even though they are very heavy. My son's been on the triangle, but he's now way too big, so he's, uh, he's left us at the moment. He may come back in one day. We do sometimes have a problem getting them because I think they feel a bit shy, you know. They don't. All the mates look at them and that, and they think, but well, we've got to, and it can cause a problem. But the thing is, once they've grown out of that, there's no gaps on the horns because those old ones don't move far, like, you know. <laughs> it seems being a horn dancer is a job for life. As night time falls, there's a sense of a good job done and that Abbots Bromley has preserved its special place in England's heritage for another year. The horns go back to the church, but it seems the roots of Abbots Bromley's horn dance are buried too deep to ever be affected by anything so superficial as the passage of time. It's just part of you though, isn't it? you know, I've grown up with it, you know, I don't know anything else. You sort of, if you're not doing it, you're thinking about it come September.